guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Okay, since well, the new title is actually mine under construction, I, I always have to accessorize, you know what I mean? And I thought, only if I can live this way, right, that we will always be under construction. You know, we always talk about that a renewal of mine now, my hair's gonna be messed up. Holy Spirit, you fix it. Fix my hair. <laughs> we'll laugh. Um, but I'm excited about this new series because I believe that we do need to. We, you know, we, we take about, you know, knowing, growing in Christ and knowing who we are. Sometimes I think we take it very lightly. And we, you know, there are so many books written about like the battlefield of the mind, and, and we read it, and I have read tons of them. But it's one thing is to read something, and another thing is to live it. And I believe that this year is a great year. It's a great year because we're alive. It's a great year because we're breathing. It's a great year because God said it will be. So we will have to take his word for it and say, this is going to be my year. But it's hard to, to stay uh, in faith. It's hard to stay faithful to God when our mind hasn't made up its mind. It's really hard. There's days that we're in it to win it, and there's days that you're out because you're out. And I believe that God is asking us, he's asking his people, he's asking his church. He wants us to be sta stable in all of our ways. But you know that the only way that you and I can be stable is through the word of God. The only way that we can be stable is, is trusting that we need to do what the word says that we need to do, and we need to start reconstructing our mind. The Bible says that, that we need to get a new attitude about life. And I'm going to give you my first scripture. Well, my first scripture says that we have to fix our thoughts on Jesus. And Hebrews 3.1 says this. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Whom he acknowledged as our, whom we acknowledge as an apostle and high priest. He says, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Have you ever been fixated on something? You know what it means to be fixated? It means when you're stuck. You, you, you look at something, you're mesmerized. And I used to work with kids um, uh, years ago. I used to work for the LA USD, and I worked with children with special needs, and, and, and I love working for them. But one of the things that some of the kids had, they were fixated. They were fixated with toys or they were fixated with an object. And no matter how much, they could hold something. And they were so fixated. You, you could be passing like hands and doing all this noise. And they were so fixated on it. Nothing, no distraction, no sound, no nothing. I, could, I, could be sing, I was singing to them. I was loud. But they were so fixated. Their minds, their thoughts were so fixated on this object that nothing would move them. They were stuck. And that's a problem. When you're, when you're a teacher and your kids are fixated on, on, on a pen, or the kids are fixated on something else and you're trying to teach them. But God is telling us, I actually want you to be fixated on me. I want you to be stuck on me. What that song, Stuck on Me? Is that a song, right? It's an old song, right? Stuck on me? No, nobody knows it. Is it the 70s songs? There you go. That's all I remember. Stuck on me. Is that God will, want, uh, will sing us a lullaby and say, be stuck on me. But we're stuck. Have you ever been stuck in a problem? Have you ever been stuck in a year? Have you ever been stuck on, on, on a situation that took place and you, you're stuck in it because you relive it every day? Maybe 10 times a day. And some of us are even better 20 times a day. And some of us 30 times a day. It's not enough hours to rehearse and fixate our eyes or our thoughts on those things. And God is saying, I want you to reconstruct. I told the Lord, have you, it's like coming into a house and, and he's, always, he's always interested in upgrading us. 
He doesn't want us to stay back. He doesn't want us to live in the past. But I was telling God, you know, you, you do a lot of renewal. You want me to renew every room. I remember when we bought our house and, you know, my husband is wonderful, but he's not a, a, a fix-it guy. Right, baby, you're not. I mean, he's wonderful. He can preach. He can cook, you know. He can clean. But when it comes to something being broken, it's like it's broken in the house, right? But he said this year, so we had, you know, we, we, were, we were fixing, uh, we were decorating, recon reconstructing, or upgrading every room one at a time. And other people were doing it. We were paying and they were doing it. But there was this room that my husband said, that's my room. I'm going to upgrade it. I was like, oh, Jesus. It was a bathroom. <laughs> we still have the house. It still looks like that since we bought it now. No, he did fix it. He did uh, put a little bit of touches. How do you know? Because he started sanding off one part, and then he never finished. <laughs> so that's our mark, like, your decor is there. But that's how I feel in my life many times. That God is, takes one area of our lives, and he says, I want you to, we're going to upgrade this room. You have an issue here in finances, right? It could be in finances. You have an issue in family. You have an issue in, in, in your time. You have an issue with your talent. You have, we have a source of issues. If we were sitting here, you have issues. I have issues. And sometimes my issues have issues. And God knows this. He's not afraid of our issues. He's not afraid. He's not shaken. He's not worried. He's not disappointed. Because he knows he can come into our lives and upgrade us at any moment. But the problem is that sometimes you feel like he wants to upgrade from one room to another room and you want a little vacation. I just want to have people over. Can we have every room done? And I feel like he says, no. There's so much to the life that he died for that he wants us to live in this upgraded life that sometimes we don't want. Because there is a process. For everything, there is a process, right? We just finished a great message, a great series on process. We don't like the process. But I believe if you're sitting in this room, there's so many people right now in this room that you have more problems with your mind than with your finances. The reality. If all of us will open up and say, you know what? I do. I have a problem here. The problem is that it's, that we, it's so hard because we don't want to renew our mind. It's so hard because we love to entertain our own thoughts. It's so hard because we want to do what we want to do. And I want God to do me, to do me and, and change me and, and then upgrade me. But I just want God and I want, I want him to send angels to touch me. And then they just touch me and they do like fairy dust or heavenly dust. And then I wake up wonderful in the morning. Like a renewed woman. But see, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. If we want to reconstruct our mind, if you want to reconstruct our lives, if you want to be a constant renewal, and it's a constant renewal, we need to constantly be in the word of God. We need to, we need to think how he thinks. Let us go to Ephesians 4, 20 to 24. This is um, Paul, the apostle Paul speaking. A man who used to think he had a, 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 the apostle Paul, we love him, and he wrote most of the New Testament, but he had to do a lot of mind renewal because he used to think that he was doing a favor to God by killing all the Christians, and yet he has an encounter with God, and he submits, and he yields himself to God, and then we get to read what he said for you and I to live and to do, and this is what he says in Ephesians 4.20. It says that however, in that however, you have to read it. I don't have time to read it all, but you have to read what it says before. And what he's talking about before this, this uh, scripture, he's talking about that sometimes we can have our hearts can be blind. It says that your heart and your mind can be blind because we want to do what we want to do. We want to do it in the flesh. So he's talking about all of those things that the sinful nature wants to do. But after this, this is what he says. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off 
to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. He said, you put off. See, we come to Jesus and we receive, we, we receive our salvation. And the moment you say yes to the Lord and, and we made the, you know, when we made the altar call, we made the call and we say, if you need to receive Jesus, you say, yes, I do. And you do believe it because the Bible says that with our mouth we confess, but with our heart we believe. Right? We know a lot of Christians that they are saved. They're going to heaven, but they live like hell. Right? Why do they live like hell? It's not because God wants them to be poor. It's not because God wants them to be in destruction. No, it's because they are choosing not to renew and upgrade their mind. Because you can be, you can be saved, but you can still live the same way of life that you used to live before. Your old self, your old nature, you're still having the same, the same problems. You're still dealing with the same issues. You're still talking about year 1995 or whatever year you're stuck on. And the Bible says, you and I, you and I can have the mind of Christ. You and I have the power to renew the attitude of our mind. Do you know that your attitude has a mind and your mind has an attitude? And I'm about to quote you someone who is um, very famous but I like what he says, and if you, you, you probably know who he is, but this is what he says. This is a famous quote. He says, the problem is not the problem. The problem is the attitude about the problem. Do you understand? He goes like this. Do you understand? It's Jack Sparrow. <laughs> Jack Sparrow said that. Have you seen the movie? He's half high, and I don't know where he's on. But his mind was renewed about problems. I was like, Jack Sparrow? Inspired by the word of God? See, the problem is not the problem, which is a reality. The problem is not your family. The problem is not your finances. The problem is not the economy. The problem is not the president. The problem is that your attitude regarding the problem. The problem is that we're still seeing the problem according to our own opinion, according to what CNN is saying, according to whoever is saying, or according to what you used to believe before, right? Do you know that right now a lot of people are so concerned with the country in the times that we're living? They're so concerned. I'm like, we should be rejoicing. Why? Why should we rejoice? Don't you hear? No, it's because that's not the problem. The problem is that we are seeing it through the eyes of what the media, whatever is saying. No, the reality, that reality that God wants to have and renew our mind and construct the mind in our mind right now is that better days are ahead for the children of God. The reality is that you and I are not subject to, to the finances or, or the economy of this world. The reality is that the one who finances my economy is that God in heaven, the almighty one. The reality is that if you and I are givers, we're tithers and we're generous. The reality is that he said that he's going to do abundantly above what I'm asking or thinking or even imagining. That is my reality. But do you know how many times when you have the reality of life, the facts of life are louder and clear. And then God is telling you, I don't want you to look at the fact right now. I just want you to see my reality, the new reality that you and I have in him. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. It's not easy, but it's doable. Jesus never said, God never said, life is going to be easy. Where do we get that? I used to say that all the time. I think I was off for like, I've been saved for 20 years. I think I said it for, I don't know, 16 years. I was waiting for life to get easier. And I would tell people, it's going to get easier. It's going to get easier. No, it doesn't get easier. We need to get stronger. We need to get stronger. As I told you, I'm back to working out. Yay, yay. And my workout is just, just me walking on a treadmill. 
Everybody's like, oh. you know what? That's them. I started at 1.9, you know, like, right? As long as I'm going. It took me a whole hour to do three miles. And this was last, last, last week or two weeks ago. You know, yesterday I went and I was very happy. I was at 3.5. And I was a lot. I was <laughs> but I did four miles. You see, it's the same process. It's not, it's the, the, the treadmill is not doing anything different, but I'm getting stronger. Do you see this muscle? <laughs> the muscle, <laughs> it's getting stronger. See this muscle? I don't do I don't do that. I just call them forth. I just walk. It's too much. You start where you can. You want to renew your mind? You start with one scripture. Oh, but the sister and the brother, they read 400 scripture, but that's them. Good for them. Rejoice for those. You start, how about you start with one scripture that today you're going to chew on that scripture, you're going to do that scripture, you're going to go, and today I'm going to do that scripture. You know that that's what God cares about? We're not in a competition with anyone. You're the only one that you compete, you compete with yourself. I'm a better, I need to be a better Virginia than I was today. Tomorrow I better be a better one than I was today. Right? Tomorrow I'm hoping by the choices that I made today that I'll be stronger. Tomorrow I'm expecting myself to be a little bit more in line with God because of the word that I put in me today. Right? So if we do it daily, because this is a, new, a, a renewal, we, we think sometimes a lot of people don't even want to hear about the renewal of the mind. They feel like, I already arrived. Have you ever felt that you arrived? Many times I feel like I arrived. I'm like, can somebody give me a crown? Can somebody, God, can you do trumpets and can you tell people that I have a right? The moment you think like that, oh, let's get back into the classroom, right? You need to know that the enemy is after your mind. He's after your mind. He's not after your car. He can't even drive. He can't. That's what I believe. He's not after your car. He's not after my high heels. He's not after my home. He doesn't need a home. But he's after my thoughts. He's after your thoughts. He's after your mind. And that's what he wants. Because he knows that if we give him entrance here, he's going to have a play day. He knows that if we, if, if we allow him to break in, oh, he's coming in. He can knock all he wants. Before, and I still do here and there, you know, because, hey, it's, it's, it's a continual renewal of the mind, right? We are going from glory to glory. That means from, from problem to another one. But conquering, right? But I remember how many times I allowed the enemy, not even to break in. You, you, let's go. Come in. Let's have coffee. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk about life. Let me tell you what I think. Let me tell you how I'm feeling. Okay, he does it many times in our minds because we haven't fixated our thoughts on him because we don't have enough word in us. We invite him in. He doesn't even have to break in. We're actually looking for him. And God wants us to shut every door in our lives that allows him to come in. I'm going to tell you, he is a defeated foe. Let's go to 1 Peter 5, 7 and 8. And I love this verse. Well, I love all the verses that I read. You're going to hear this every Wednesday and say, like, she said that her fa favorite verse was another one. Well, every Wednesday I have a favorite. First Peter 5, 7 and 8. It says, casting all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, and all your concerns once and for all on him. For he cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. Do you know that when we have anxiety, when we're so worried, he says that he is actually watching over you and me with deepest affection. 
you understand? It's like a, a parent. It's when your baby, you know, when you're a new, a new mom or a new daddy and your baby just, you don't even know, like you're watching him 24-7. And if he cries, you pick him up really fast, right? Because you're watching the baby or your, or your kid with such deepest affection. And I feel like, wow, God says that he watches over us when we are freaking out. When we have anxiety to the 10th power. But he says, I want you to cast it all, your cares, everything, your worries, your anxieties, your concerns, given to me. And he says, he watches over you very carefully. He says, be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. The enemy of yours, we do have an enemy. No, it's not your spouse. It's not your boss. It's not president, whoever. No, it's the devil. That's our enemy. He says, because the enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around you, uh, about like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry. Seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Be firm in your faith against his attack. Rooted, established, immovable. Knowing that the same experience of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. You do not suffer alone. Have you ever noticed that when you're in a deep uh, pile of dung or problems, right? And then you have this anxiety and you have this worry and you have all this. You, you sometimes feel that you're the only one going through that. And then God is not only saying, you know what, I want you to give me every anxiety. I want you to give me every worry because I care for you. And I want you to be sober-minded because you do have an enemy and he walks like a lion. He's not a lion, but he walks like one. And what does he want to do? You know, the enemy, the devil, our adversary, I said, is out to get our mind. He's here to stress you out. Have you ever been stressed out? Is it only me here and there? No, he's here to stress you out, not give you a little stress. He wants to stress you out. He wants to break you down. He wants to make you quit. He wants you to think that you can't get up, that you cannot do it anymore. He wants you to give up on your dreams. He wants you to give up on your life. He wants you to give up on the promises of God. And eventually what he wants is he wants you to give up on God. That's what he wants. Yeah, but he says that he walks around like a roaring lion. So that means, have you ever heard a roar of a lion? Not on TV, but like, I remember one time being at the zoo. And what do you do at the zoo? You eat, right? I always eat. Like, I find the first, oh, where am I going to eat? Like, so you could walk happy with your Cheetos and whatever, right? Got to the zoo, and I was getting my Cheetos, and, and it was the lion, um, whatever, den or whatever, the little place. I am turned back, and all of a sudden, this lion was roaring. I almost fainted. I was like, what is this? Like, he was like, horror. It's, 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 it's scary. It's, it's he's roaring because he wants to make you afraid. He wants to make you so afraid, and then we're afraid of fear. Have you been afraid of fear? Do you know the devil is a... Uh, the devil is, it's, 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 what does a lion do? They, they, they seek, they're, they're seeking their prey. They're stalkers. Always like on the lookout. And then they come for the kill. And he, the Bible tells us, God is saying, I want you to be sober minded. I want you to watch what you think because the devil has a plan. And sometimes I'm like, oh, my gosh, Virginia, get a plan together because the enemy has a plan. And the, dev and, and, the, and the word of God tells us he has a plan. The plan is that he's going to seek you. He's going to go try to get you. And he's going to try to devour you. But he says that he walks around and he's hungry. And I thought to myself, you know, if he's hungry, that means that maybe I get to feed him. How do we feed the enemy? We feed him with our thoughts. 
So that means we can starve them. Right? Well, we say, feed the dog that you want. What is it, the saying? I, I should I'm like, they, there you go, what he said. If you're Hispanic from the 70s and 80s, it's like this guy named El Chapulín Colorado. He was like a superhero. He always tried to say sayings, and he always mixed them. That's me, like, the dog is, no, anyways, praise Jesus. Come back, Holy Spirit. But what was it? That one. Whatever dog, right? Okay, so we have a lion. We do. The Bible says that our, our Jesus, he is the lion. He is the lion of Judah. I mean, he is the lion, right? But then we have an enemy that looks like a lion, acts like a lion, pretends to be a lion. And then I have a choice because I was reading, it says that he walks around and he is hungry. And I was like, okay, well then we get, I, I have given him good portions. I've been feeding sometimes the wrong lion. How do you feed the wrong lion? How do you feed into the enemy? Is when I allow fear because he comes to threaten a roaring lion. It, it's just telling when the lion roars is if, because he's letting you, I'm coming to get you. I'm coming for you. And sometimes it's the threat of what might happen. It hasn't happened, but there's all of us, you and I, all of us deal with something that uh, my next uh my next portion of, of this series is, uh, next Wednesday, is removing strongholds. There, there are some strongholds in our lives. And he comes for those little things. He knows what you fear the most. You can say, all of us here sitting, we all have fears. You say, no, I don't have fear. Well, maybe you have fear to speaking in public. That's fear. Just different than mine, right? All of us have some type of fear. But that's what God says. I have not given you the spirit of fear, so don't worry. When you get fear, I, have did, I didn't give that to you. Recognize what when fear comes, it didn't come from your heavenly father. Because actually what I have given to you is the spirit of love or power. And you have a sober mind. Right? You and I are able to have a sober mind. That means that I get to feed what I want to feed. Didn't Jesus says that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? But how many times, really, how many times, uh, to being honest, being honest, like there's times in my life that I, I, I you know my stories. But even now, there's times in my life that I have read the Bible. But I, I read the Bible. I read my chapters. I pray. But inside of me, there was this, still this, hmm, this uneasiness. But you see, when we do that, that means that we're not feeding our faith. At that moment, we're feeding the doubt. We're feeding the threat of the enemy. And I'm here to tell you that God doesn't want you to be afraid of his threats. What is he threatening you with this, uh, this evening? What is it a threat that is so vivid, it's so real in your life that it kind of has crippled you? What is it that he's telling you? Because it's a threat is something that hasn't happened. A threat is you saying, I'm going to do this. This is what's going to happen to you. And we allowed his threat, we allow his roar to keep us bound. And God says, if we're going to go under construction with our mind, then we need to settle it in our thoughts. And we need to know who we are. Because it's so easy to forget who we are. When times are hard, that's when we need faith. If everything is going well, then we don't need faith. So life is not going to be easy. Life is not going to be um, rosy. But God wants you to not know that life with him, we do overcome. We are able to conquer. We are able to have peace in our mind. Do you know I used to suffer depression for years. Do you know that that is the most horrible thing that someone can experience depression? Anxiety and worry because it means that you don't see hope. 
Everything that you see, it's you're seeing it from a point of view of a dark hole, and you cannot see the light. Someone can come in and tell you, okay, let me describe you what you what God has in front of you. Let me describe you what your future looks like. Let me tell you what God is doing now, it's about to do. But when you're in depression, it's really blinding. But you know what God said to me? Tell them that my word is able to deliver them. Do you know that the word of God is the only thing that is able to deliver you and me? The word of God. The word of God. Let me give you a few scriptures and then I, I close it with the word of God. But Isaiah 23, 26, 3 says this. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The NLT says you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. All whose thoughts, whose thoughts are fixed on you. So whenever we don't have peace, have you ever had those moments that there is zero peace in the camp? Right? In the camp. We're smiling in the outside. We're skipping in the outside we're dressed beautifully in the outside but inside is a civil war happening inside there is bomb bombs and all this di uh, dynamite going off you know what that means it's just to do a checkup according to the word that means you know virginia if you're feeling like that today that means you haven't you haven't fixed your thought on jesus today you haven't you haven't well, how do we do that? How do we, how, do we, how do we go under this construction? How do we go under this upgrade? How do we stay in peace? I tell you how. We resist the devil. He says, resist him. Resist him. And though the scripture says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And let the peace of God, which surpass, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. We can only win and we can only succeed with the word of God. I think, did I give you the scripture, James? No. Okay, James. James talks about, it says that is the only, the only thing that can save our soul <laughs> is James says, is the engrafted word of God. He says the engrafted, the implanted word of God is able to save your soul. What is engrafted is when in the, a, a piece of skin, they bring a piece of skin and they put it on yours, on your tissue. And then that tissue becomes one with your tissue. Now it's just one tissue. So that means that if the engrafted word of God is, it's, it means that I cease just from quoting the scripture. But at some point in my life, I have become one with the word. Now I don't think just like Virginia. Now I start thinking how the word thinks. The engrafted word of God is able to save your mind. The engrafted word of God is able to save your memories. God doesn't erase our memories. Don't you wish sometimes like God gave me a lobotomy? It'll be easier, right? I don't have to deal with the emotion, with the process. I just could be like, can you just press something in my mind and erase? And you wake up happy like nothing happened. No, but it's the engrafted word of God that is able to save our memories. You know what that means? That means that we're able to remember, but there's no pain linked to it. It's the engrafted word of God that is able to save our emotions. It's the engrafted word of God that is able to save our feelings and everything that comes with it. It's the engrafted word of God. What does that mean? What I'm asking you tonight, and I believe that God is asking you, is that we run to his word. That we run to his word. Like, you, you know how many people say, I haven't been fed. I'm not being fed at the church. Well, because a church is not supposed to feed you. You know, we're not in a tube. We were not born. Uh, the only time I remember my God and my baby being fed is when he was in NICU because he couldn't eat. He couldn't even have a baba. 
No, you and I are supposed to feed ourselves with his faithfulness. You and I as children of God, we are supposed to run to the word and let the word become one with us. To the point that we don't even recognize ourselves. Right? No, we feed ourselves. We, we go to the word of God and let the word of God, if you find yourself tonight and you're anxious and, and you have depression or maybe you're emotionally disturbed or you can't sleep because how many times we know that we have gone to sleep. There's times in my life that I have gone to sleep. It slept eight hours, but then I woke up and I wasn't rested. Because sleep won't give you rest, but, but peace of mind will do. And I believe that God wants us to live like that, that no matter what comes our way, no matter what we go through, no, no matter what we encounter, he said that this year is a year of breakthrough, so no matter, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have problems. It means that, hey, no, he's with me. He's with you. And let the word of God change you. Sorry, my love, you were here I'm for me. I'm sorry. You told me to come up anytime you want me to. So yes, I, I did. I give you permission. You know what? Let me tell you something. Um, Here's a simple riddle. How do you eat a camel? <laughs> Who told you that lie? You don't eat camels. What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> it's the same way with, um, with, with what she's saying. Resist the devil and he will flee, right? Mm -hmm. So the key is this. You have to start learning how to resist the thoughts that you keep creating. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You know, uh, they say that 60 to 90. We think about 60 to 90 thoughts per day. Okay, that's what we average. Probably 90 is the woman, 60 is the guy. I think right? that's low bowling it. Yeah, but it's, it's scientifically proven that that's about how many thoughts we think about. But you know what? You want, you want to know what's even more interesting? That 96% of our daily thoughts that we think every day are the thoughts of the day before. Hmm. And only 4%... Uh, of 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 uh, of thoughts that we have every day, are new thoughts. Mm. So just just think for a minute. You know, you keep saying that the the answer, the only answer to renew your mind is 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 really it's taking the word of God. I mean, God gave us the answer, Romans twelve, chapter two, right? He says, and do not be conformed to this world. You know, when I asked the question, how do you eat an elephant? Someone said, one bite at a time. Well, no, that's the elephant. <laughs> But you know what happens is we keep buying what everyone else is saying when why don't we just get back to the truth? And the truth is that, you know what? Romans 12, 2 says, not only not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and it's only through the washing of the word of God. Yeah. And so I think so many of us, we're, we're trying to find these very cool ways, these very dynamic ways, the, the 10 steps and the reality is that, you know what? Uh, God's word breathes life. That's the only book that you can read that actually is something you can get fresh in you every time you read it. Every time I read a story in the Bible, it's like I get a new revela revelation out of it. Why? Because he's, he's wanting to keep the, the relationship fresh and he's wanting to renew our mind. And so as a man thinks, so is he. As a woman thinks, so is she. And so what do we do? Well, we have to pay attention to what we're thinking about. I think so many times. I know that the verse that she read says, you know what, uh, be sober. Well, that to me says pay attention, mm -hmm. right? Because the enemy, your adversary, walks about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. So what if you just started thinking this, that, that the thoughts that you're having every day could be a lion that's trying to eat you up. Mm -hmm. And so if we just pay attention to that lion, right, that lion, lying, lion, <laughs> uh, whatever's coming that's out, uh, you have to resist it and say no. No, but you can't just resist without replacement. You can't. So when you resist a negative thought, you have to replace it with something better. You know what the something better is? The word. If you think you're stupid, well, guess what? The Bible says that you're the head, not the tail. You're above and not beneath. Right? If you're sick in body, great. The doctor says, hey, you got cancer. Well, guess what? Jesus said, by my stripes, you're healed. You right now, maybe you're broke. Well, God says, I own a cattle on a thousand hills. And bless you'll be coming in and bless you'll be going out. What if we were to resist the thought? Yeah. 
that is chewing us up, right? And we start feeding on the right thoughts that start building us up. And the only way to do that is, is resist, replace. But you can't resist until you pay attention. You can't. And you have to accept the fact that, you know what, if, if, if there is some issues right now in your life, find someone that's trustworthy um, and ask them because most people will, 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 will tell you, I'm good, but I can see something that you can't see. And so when someone really wants to know what's happening, go ask the person, go ask someone else that you trust. Say, hey, you know what, for example, new, just human nature, people are negative. Human nature. That was the, that's the nature of this world. We're negative. But God's nature is, man, it's renewing you to think, to think in faith, to believe, to trust. But ask someone, hey, am I negative? Like when I'm around you, do, do I sound like a negative? Am I a, 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 you know, someone that just sucks the life out of you and everybody around the room? And don't be upset if they tell you, you know what? Actually, you are. You're always negative. You know, I love you, man. But I, I, you know what? I, I don't even like bringing anything to you because... I'm going to hear it's not going to work. It's not going to, I, I can't stand that. Maybe your environment right now is negative, And now you've become negative. And so you can't blame your environment. You could only blame yourself. Because God called us to change the world, not the world change us. And so I love this new series she's doing on Mind under construction. So what's your homework tonight? Tomorrow, wake up and pay attention to what you think about. Pay attention. Like when that thought comes, write it down. What did you say? So that by the end of the night, you can maybe take a log. Because it's hard to measure what you think. But when you write something, you can measure it now. Yes. So write it down. Every negative thought you thought that day. I know it's going to be a pain in the butt, but do you want change? It's called work. Right? Yes. And then let's up the 4%, you know, to like maybe a 10%. And we say, today I'll have 10% of new thoughts. Yes. But the only way to have new thoughts is by replacing the old ones. Yes. Okay, so let's go to work. Let's change. And, uh, and I know that as you go on in this series, it's going to be amazing. I can't wait. I'm even being rocked right now. Okay. And you're reminding me of some things as well. So just, just remember that tomorrow. Everybody say mañana. Yeah, tomorrow, be intentional. Tomorrow, think about what you're thinking. Like for real. Don't just say, amen, praise God. <laughs> you know? That's your Christianese talking do you, now. Do you, do you know that the Bible says that you can think yourself happy? Paul oh, said. I should have brought that video. Paul says, uh, it Damn. read it down in Acts 26 too. And, uh, and I. Your homework is always to read the word when you come on Wednesday, right? But you should read the entire passage because you see, he went before King Agrippa. And he says to King Agrippa, he's been in prison for years. He's been flogged. He's been like all these horrible things. And he wasn't even to be present to be tell the story or to share with King Agrippa. He needed to say it to Festus. But now he's passing by this great king. He's like, hey, I want to hear about Paul. And then to, as I was reading the Bible this morning, I thought, he says, I think myself happy. Mm. I'm like, are you nuts? You think yourself happy. And he says he thought his, himself happy because he saw it as an opportunity. Not of his freedom because he was already free in his mind. He didn't care about the chains. He always said, I'm a, I'm a prisoner, you know, bond servant for Jesus. So he, he didn't care. His only care about in his life was that he got to share Jesus to King Agrippa. But I'm like, after all that, he says, I think myself happy. Do you know how many times I've thought myself, my thoughts took me into depression. It was my thoughts that led me into despair. It was my thoughts that led me into a hole. It wasn't God. No, it was my own thoughts. So I love what you said that, that we can write down what we think. I'm, I'm like, I would need a lot of paper. Yeah. But it's, right? but it's, it's a good challenge. And, and you know what? I, I think we all complicate this. I think everybody here wants change. Who wants change right now? There's some things you want. Okay, but it's, it's like this. Just 
I know it's a stupid analogy, but it works for me. Uh, it's like you're trying to drive your car. You need to go to work tomorrow. And the car doesn't start. And then you realize, dang, I have no gas. Well, what are you going to do? You can go get gas and fill her up, right? And so we already know what our problems are. And so we complicate it by trying to figure out, I wonder what I need. And you're trying to figure, you, you need gas. <laughs> I know it's a dumb illustration, but it makes sense, right? What do you need? I need the word. Duh. Right? It's like the big duh. I need the word. I need, my, my, the word is my fuel. The word is my change. The word is my renewal. God said it, and we're trying to figure out, how am I going to change? How am I going to? And you just want to hear the next clever thing for your change, my change. Guess what? It doesn't exist. There's only one who can fix you, and his name is Jesus. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.